The Could Be Better podcast is sponsored in part by Old Mother Brewing Company, located in the heart of downtown Frederick at 526 North Market Street. Not only does the brewery play host to a ton of Could Be Better shows, but it offers the tastiest beers and cocktails around. Looking for something refreshing and crushable? Try their Hank, which is great for a laid-back summer afternoon. In need of a cozy, heavy stout? Give the Kalista, which took home Best in Show honors at the 2022 Maryland Craft Beer Competition, a try. To learn more about the brewery, including what they have on tap each day, visit www.oldmother.com or on Instagram at at Old Mother Brewing. Welcome to the Could Be Better podcast car edition. I'm here with my commuter in crime, Colin McGuire. Oh. It's a long way down from best friend. Now it's a commuter in crime. It sounds but, uh, sounds cool though, right? Sounds good. It probably sounds better than the microphone. I mean, even I, I tried again to listen to our little manifesto from a couple weeks ago. Uh, when that popped up on my feed and, and we're still having the issues. I'm still hiccuping. Hmm. Well, you're not hiccuping now. So good yeah. good way to go that you, uh, do you believe in the wives tale that if you drink water through a paper towel, you can immediately lose your hiccups? No, but I'll have to try that. Works for me almost every time. I'll have to try that with my kid because he doesn't like to hiccup. He doesn't, oh, doesn't like to get, yeah. Getting a kid to drink through anything with a paper towel over it, that sounds like a challenge and does not sound fun. Yeah, it probably sounds like waterboarding, actually, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of waterboarding, check out our sister podcast, Serial, where they talk this season about <laughs> Guantanamo Bay. Um, yeah. So this is this is a fun episode, and uh, you get into talking with Jay Robbins, who is the, um uh staple in Baltimore punk um and, and we're we're gracious that uh, he got to spend some time with with you and talk about things on this show and uh they're they're playing a show literally uh days from now on June 9th at FAC and so I'm I'm assuming some of the interview Colin talked a little bit about that show uh very little of it but yeah we mentioned that I asked him if he had played Frederick before he said he had as you'll hear um, but it was a long time ago and I think he said nobody showed up. So he's hoping people show up for this. Now, do we think, is this a, <clears throat> back to our manifesto, is this a band problem or is this a Frederick problem, right? Like if, if the J Robbins came to lowercase V Frederick of Maryland and nobody showed up, I mean, like what's, who's, is our promoters terrible? Like what's, what's happening here? What's, who is the problem? What well, is I Frederick? I don't think yeah, we should we should get Declan on. We should. He he uh, is he is in the ranks for next season. Uh I don't think he came as Jay Robbins. I think this was before he was Jay Robbins in a different band. I think the the name of this it was, I think he said it might have been his first band even uh so forever and ever ago. I think the name of the band was Samuel Powers, but I'm not sure. No, <laughs> but he uh, he uh came and said he said he's uh, kept an eye. I mean, everybody will hear this if they stick around, but he's kept an eye on Frederick uh, with a lot of cool stuff going on. He says a lot of nice things about Frederick um, and he's wanted to get up to Frederick uh, to play. So he's going to have that chance this weekend. Is that a Sunday? It's Is a Sunday night. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we are all going to go to church like good boys and then uh, change out of our khaki slacks and then go right to FAC to load in. Uh, for the show and it's gonna be a blast um are you knowing could, are could you be better is running sound sir uh -huh. so you so, are you are running sound yeah so i will be there uh, uh my buddy dylan will be there my buddy spencer will be there it will be a party i'm just hoping to get upgraded to buddy you know no 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 commuter and crime way higher than buddy That's, oh man because yeah, that means I, we're, that means we're cellmates that's <laughs> sale mates soul mates sale mates do you know uh six years ago today double motorcycle recorded the second album today june 3rd 
uh i guess this month it's in a couple, but I was, it popped up in my memories that's the only reason i'm i'm bringing that up but nobody cares about that what they care about is jay robbins i absolute do ca- legend he's a absolute legend uh local legend you will hear i think uh there's an excerpt of our conversation that appears in the newspaper uh that will i think drop the same day this episode drops so how's that for synergy you welcome arts council uh i think i i think i might have asked six questions in a matter of an hour like that might have been it he's a he's a he's got a lot of stuff to say a lot of interesting stuff to say i hope people listen to him and i hope people listen to the song evil by devil motorcycle (laughs) everywhere you can find music it is there and um, it was written by Colin McGuire and Joe Gillette. And it is a song that uh, speaks to the uh, infamous and legendary nature of all things about Frederick, where it references in the two minutes and 10 seconds of this amazing song, uh, Kathy Nola, wish list, and not wanting to be an evil person. But I don't think our guest today, Jay, is evil. I don't think he is. I don't think he I don't is. think he is. I I don't think so. Uh, uh, there's. I was gonna cite more lyrics, but I think you you knocked them all out when you when you mentioned <laughs> Cafe Nola and uh, wish list. But oh, there's the change of tire at McDonald's. There's that. But uh, yeah, yeah, he's not evil. He's. We talk about him being on Atlantic. They were on Atlantic for a while. Um, he had a pretty good experience. He he didn't have any bad things to say. He's produced. I don't know, Chris. Did you look into his career? He's everybody produced some... war on women. He's done like tons of cool records. Yeah, he did promise ring records. He works. He you know when he talked about Frederick, he's talking about Clutch a little bit. Works with them. Um, Me without you did some Me without you records. So whoa! Yeah. Uh, shout out to the Timberwolves. They did a uh, Me without you cover, and Marcus sang every single word. Look at that. Mm-hmm. If only anybody in that band talked to me anymore. Wait. You I can... thought you were going to say if anybody in that band had people come out and watch them anymore, because that's Whoa. also what happened on Friday. That was tough. <laughs> but Friday nights Whoa. are hard, guys. Friday nights are hard. Um, but I mean, like, yeah, I'm, I don't see, does he, I don't even see a disc. Anyway, it doesn't. Okay, I'm looking here. Ponytail, Clutch, Jets to Brazil, Hey Mercedes. Dismemberment? Plan? This dismemberment plan, the promise yeah. ring, uh, jawbreaker against me, modern life is war, murder by death, me without you. I didn't know he did anything with <gasps> Lemuria. That's awesome. Caustic yeah. Casanova. Look at that. Yeah. Frederick people. He did the sword. That rules. And um that's that's amazing. Well, anyway, so I I am excited to listen to this um this interview. I'm excited for Jay to come to Frederick. Uh, shout out to the band uh Gaspers, who's gonna be on our, our season finale next week. So if you came to the show, found out about the podcast, uh, wait until this upcoming Thursday, which would be uh, none other day than June the 13th, where we will have our uh-huh. final episode and we'll have a bootleg edition of when Gaspers played at Old Mother. And it's it's probably my favorite bootleg uh, Dylan has ever done. So I'm very excited. Now, um, hope to see you all this Sunday, June 9th um, at FAC for some Gaspers, some Jay Robbins, and I believe it's... Oh, I forget the other name of the band. Uh, they have a really cool, long name that's really hard to remember. Oh, crap. Jackie and the Treehorns? I think that's it. Yeah, um, it's something like that. Yeah, yeah. very excited because their their sound is really cool. And I like doing, I like being in that room. Rest in peace, FAC, having a cool spot. And uh, this is our interview with, uh, Colin's interview with Jay. Are you in a band in need of merch to hustle or entice your fans who won't buy your latest album? How about a business simply looking to spread the word about your brand that you want to be the next goopy lifestyle movement? Specialties in Frederick is the place for you. Supporting local artists, businesses, and really everything else in between, Specialties is the premier printing shop for anyone trying to expand their presence through pretty much everything that can be worn. And yes, even that. Be it embroidery, apparel, or promo products, special tees make sure your designs stand above the rest, sort of like The Undertaker versus Yokozuna at WrestleMania 9. Tell them could be better sent you and get 10% off your first order today. To learn more, 
visit them online at www.special-tees.com. That is www.special-tees.com. So you say you want to be a rock and roll star? It's easy. Well, kind of. Just visit the Frederick Let There Be Rock School in Frederick, Maryland to get your superstar dreams off the ground with your first lesson free if you tell them Could Be Better sent you. That's right. Free. F-R-E. D-E-R-I-C-K. In addition to offering lessons on everything from voice to guitar, Let There Be Rock School in Frederick also provides students with opportunities to perform live and on a stage in front of a crowd as part of the school's showcase of events, including at Old Mother Brewing Company. To learn more about the school and all the things that they have to offer, visit www.frederickrockschool.com. And again, if you tell them Could Be Better sent you, you'll get your first lesson free. F-R-E-E, superstardom, or at least getting better at playing Take Me Out by Franz Fernadad is right around the corner. Um, so I, I kind of thought I'd start here. Have you played Frederick before? Um, I think the last time I played a show in Frederick uh, was maybe like 20, it was over 20 years ago. Wow. Cool. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, it was not a particularly auspicious show. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, can, uh, what does that mean? Can you go into detail on that? <laughs> no, no, it just was, um, it was in my, uh, my, my old band, Burning Airlines. I remember playing a show in Frederick um, that just was sort of like, you know, nobody really came out kind of deal. It sort of seemed like 20 years ago, I think, um, I mean, I just feel like I hear way more now about, you know, things happening in Frederick, and I know people who live there who are making music, and, I mean, you know, in the interim, like, since that, that might be the only time I've played in Frederick, I think. Hmm. Um, but, you know, since that show, I mean, I have sort of tuned in a lot more to things that were happening there, and... You know, I did studio work with Clutch, so for a while I was, you know, I spent a couple weeks going back and forth doing pre-production with them. That would have been maybe well, a while ago now. But anyway, so so I sort of have kind of got my, my um, got a much better sense of what's going on there. Hmm. So, um, and it seems like it's it's a much it's a very different place than it than it was for, for you know. As far as having a kind of scene, yeah, yeah. Are are you bringing the band, or is this a solo show? It's this is the whole band. Okay, cool. And I, I was I was looking on your site earlier, and I saw that you were you kind of have a smattering of dates out there. Um, is is touring something big this year for you? I know you have a new record out. I want to talk about in a second, but are do you guys have a lot of a, a lot of dates coming up. I saw a handful, but not many. Yeah, I did, I'm well. Uh, I put the record out in February, and the context for that is that it's my second solo record, and the first one that I put out, I put out in 2019, um, and it came out um, pretty much right around exactly around the time that my old band Drawbox was doing reunion shows mm -hmm. so in 2019 Jawbox did a fairly extensive reunion tour and um, you know I was able to take the record my record with me and sort of put it on the merch table but I didn't get a chance to go and actually play those songs in front of people after the record came out just I did just a very small handful of shows and then COVID happened mm -hmm. And, um, and I was super proud of the record and, you know, I sort of did what I could and, you know, once things started opening up again, I started playing a little bit more, but I sort of had the feeling that this record, that that first record sort of went out into the world and just kind of, you know, I mean, a lot of, you know, it's not like I'm, well, how can I, how can I say this? Um, I'm not aiming for world domination here, but I sort of felt like, oh, I didn't really get a chance to to stand behind this thing that I made. And so I thought that, um, you know, 
this time around, since, you know, then, but now my second one came out in February, I was just like, well, I'm not going to miss an opportunity to go play these songs in front of people. Um, you know, because I, because that opportunity kind of got taken away from me by, uh, COVID-19, you know? (laughs) So, um, the first time. So, um, I mean, you know, it's not going to ever be like it used to be for me in my 20s where, you know, and even in my 30s where, you know, I would go out for six and eight weeks at a time and just kind of hit it really hard like that. But, um, you know, I did a 10-day tour. We, we, the band, did a 10-day tour um, back in March and we did a three show run in the middle of April and now through the beginning of the summer um, I'm, I'm playing a sort of a sporadically more locally um, but I have some plans that are coming together for the fall as well like um, so that's you know I'm going to try and uh, get out to the west coast and also I have um, some shows planned around fest in gainesville florida um, going to and from fest so there's a, there's a lot more than i sort of there's more than i thought i was going to be doing but it's all really really exciting and i love playing and i love the people i'm playing with and i'm, I'm super happy to be playing these songs you know so yeah yeah i i wanted to to ask about touring too where where does that sit with you compared to how it used to be the the music business has changed so much over the years and and touring is 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 kind of a mixed bag anymore but it used to be a big source of income um it could it, you know it still could be but do you think it's more important now than it was back then or or what's your sort of attitude toward touring i feel like it's impossible to judge anything um accurately if you are thinking too much about the music as a business, I really think right now everything is so far out to sea um, compared to, you know, I mean, back in, you know, in say in the 90s and maybe the early 2000s, I think there were a fair few people who believed they had a strategy, you know, and there were certain things that they could, that, they could take for granted um and you know as far as like how do you put your music in front of people and how do you um you know like how do you just try to eke out a living but i um i've never really you know for good or ill i've never really thought of of the broader music business context too much, you know? I mean, I think of it in a much more uh, personal way and a more self-contained way. So uh, though I'm, I recognize that I'm really lucky that I've, I've actually made my livelihood, you know, my livelihood, my whole adult life has been related to music, but, you know, I've actually earned my living by recording other people's music and having a, a, a studio where I can do that and um, you know I, the, the actually playing music and putting out records has never been a, the, my main you know subsistence except for maybe when I was in my 20s in the brief period of time when when uh, you know Jawbox the members of Jawbox all lived in a group house together and all we really cared about was doing our band and so it's a really different, you know, to be like a real, you know, to be older and have, um, a, you know, an older person's responsibilities and a, and a sense of, you know, kind of having, having higher stakes somewhat, you know, when you're younger, you can just kind of go out and throw yourself at it. And if things don't work out the way you planned, you just sort of go into it assuming that you're going to bounce back somehow, right? Mm -hmm. um, So I feel like on a personal level, you know, it's like I'm getting older and I I, I have this sense of urgency that I want to do this while I can still do it, you know? Mm -hmm. 
but I also have a sense of being very conscious of the stakes. So it's so so I've never I've I've never gone into sort of the touring I haven't for many years gone into the touring thing um, thinking you know that that it was going to be my livelihood you know or or generate enough income to live on because it just doesn't you know mm-hmm. but but I've been very fortunate to you know do better than break even and I know a lot of bands and a lot of musicians that you know really just go out and lose money on a tour you know it doesn't it's it's just the whole thing is just kind of a um i mean it has to be a labor of love Mm -hmm. right yeah and and no one i don't think anyone knows where the quote-unquote music business is is going you know even people who align themselves squarely with the idea of the music business you know people who run labels and stuff i don't think they i don't think they've ever known but they they controlled the architecture in the past right Mm -hmm. um but now everybody is just sort of i think i think uh just kind of I mean, I think I think if you're in the music business, like major label style music business, you're probably like um, fixated on TikTok. You know, you're fixated on social media successes and trying to capitalize on those. And otherwise, I think you know. I mean, I can't speak for anybody else, but for me, I just it's all it's very much about first principles. Like, I need to create music. In, in order to feel like a whole person, you know, yeah, yeah. and it's and it's a vehicle to connect with other people and communicate, and so a big part of that for me is just being, you know, being with people in a room and trying to share a moment with them and and be present, and you know, it's not so much about creating a product and selling it at all, really. It's it's just about this kind of exchange of energy and I want to keep it going and and I think like this is a thing that um, sort of is in danger of somewhat I can't tell but in, it, sometimes I think it's it's really in danger of getting lost like that sense of like you're making music to connect with other people in 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 some kind of real way in a real way moment in a three-dimensional space together you know Mm -hmm. because things are so disconnected now um because they're so quote-unquote connected you know via the internet you know they're connected in a virtual way that like the the um i wonder if we're going to gradually lose that sense of the importance of being in a room with other people you know so but so though all those things are, are just that's kind of getting to my motivation really and um so i do think it's it's it it's a lot different in a lot of ways because for me well yeah but it's also hard to tell <laughs> it's also hard to tell <laughs> i think you know there are i mean i know i have friends who have who are old enough to have kids who are now old enough to be in bands and I can think of a couple people whose kids probably couple people I know whose kids have actually gone on tour and had these really great tours that, that make it seem like there's a thriving independent network that wants to sort of keep keep the dream alive so to speak right mm-hmm. but from my perspective it's it's just being older it's maybe harder to tap into that because a certain number of people always age out of this idea of a underground you know to some degree they do you know you or just they lose they lose energy over time because when they were in their 20s they could put on shows and you know do they had the energy to to devote to this kind of quixotic thing and you know not not everybody can stick with it so i do maybe have a little bit of a sense of like you know oh where is that network now it doesn't seem as robust as it used to but um but you know i don't know that's part of the point of 
getting out and, and doing this kind of stuff, you know, is to, is to find those connections. Yeah, so. well, yeah, you, it kind of um, leads me to one thing I did want to ask you about, and I know that it's, it's uh, I think it's over 30 years now at this point, but at one point, Jawbox was on a major label. You guys were on Atlantic, I believe, is that correct? Mm-hmm. And so with that experience, and, and especially considering everything you just said, the ways the music business has changed, and, and you talked about how you don't necessarily view music as a business. Can you, if I mean, I know it's a long time, but can you reflect a little bit on what it was like, uh, you know, being on that major label back then and probably the differences between that and how it works today? Um, well, I mean, I think we, Jawbox had a really unique um, experience because, you know, we, we, we're, we started as a band of music fans who were entirely energized by the DC punk underground that was completely DIY. You know, and in a way, even though it wasn't making political proclamations to this effect, and to some extent, it's it stood against the regular model of of you know the music business, what people think of as, as business as usual, and, you know how you do the music business. Um, and you know, but we worked very hard at this band. We really we hit it really hard for many years, and we happened to sort of be in the right place at the right time in the 90s, in the early 90s, to to take advantage of a wave, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the music business at large, where, you know, major labels, as they, as they used to do, and probably still do in a different way, but they used to do on a regular basis, you know, if they think there's something bubbling up from the underground that they can capitalize on and make their money on, that they're going to bet on, they're going to bet on it. And I think, I think we got lucky in that we signed to a major that didn't, we signed to a major at a time when the majors didn't really understand what they were trying to exploit. You know, the sort of corporate, high, higher up corporate level of the music business had no understanding of this music. They just understood that there was a groundswell happening and they wanted to try to capitalize on it. Mm-hmm. And for us, we were, and that meant that we were able to kind of dictate our own terms. And part of that was because the, the A&R guy who signed us was a an old friend of ours from the Boston hardcore scene and he knew he basically signed bands that he knew that he believed in, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, he, he already had a built in understanding, like a really strong understanding of where we came from because that's where he came from too. So, so we had this, you know, sort of sympathetic kind of right hand man, so to speak, right? We had a symp- very sympathetic a guy and a label that, I think was just, but we, we just got into that one moment where they were, they were, pre- were prepared to back it, even though they didn't understand it. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, and of course it wasn't, a, it wasn't, a, 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 it wasn't a hit record, you know, like most of the records back then that of bands that got signed didn't, they didn't have hit records. Mm-hmm. And luckily for us, it didn't end up that badly you know other people had much much worse experiences so um so i mean i have no regrets about what we did i thought we were we were scrupulous almost to a fault about trying to take our diy ethic with us into the major label world and just use the resources of the major label world to 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 open things up for us and bring us to new experiences and give us new opportunities, right? Mm-hmm. But we, we really, it, it was a goal for us to not be changed by that experience, you know, mm-hmm. as as the legend goes, you know, so many people, it's like, oh, they, they get beamed up into the mothership <laughs> and they get and they get changed, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or like suddenly someone's trying to tell you what your music is supposed to be like or whatever. So I think we, you know, we were we we were adamant that that wasn't going to happen to us, 
And I think in that regard, you know, as far as sticking to our guns, we were really successful. But so I have no regrets about the whole arc of the whole thing. When I look back at it, it was an amazing experience. But it definitely was it. We didn't start with that as our goal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we were just kind of trying to be very canny about saying yes to an opportunity that we never in our wildest dreams expected and then get the most out of it that we could on our terms. And so we really like, I mean, I feel like we really came out ahead, even though in the end what happened was, you know, the label kind of looked at, you know, it, it wasn't a success to them, even though it was a success in our eyes. And, you know, at a certain point, also this because of band dynamics and people's lives and plans and all sorts of other reasons, you know, I mean, the band broke up, which bands do, you know, it's, that's not a, that's not a tragedy. That's a thing that, that bands do. So, um, so I, I guess it's just a long winded way of saying, um, I, I don't think, I mean, to get more back to your question, like, I don't think those kind of opportunities exist for bands, you know, for young bands anymore. I really don't think they do. I think that the one thing, one thing that majors learned from the nineties is to not bet on things they don't understand in the same way. And you know, if they're, if they're going to bet on anything, it, they are going to bet on something that's already massively successful without them. And so, you know, and for me, what I learned is I am much, much happier on a small scale working with my friends. You know, I'm very fortunate that I was able to come back from that Atlantic Records experience and, you know, and feel like I had never lost that connection to the, uh, to the scene that I came from, you know, mm -hmm. and because everything in that, in that, it, 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 every, you know, everything that Jawbox did and everything that I've done has really grown, you know, out of friendships and this much more grassroots and, um, you know, it's, that's why I say it's not a business, you know, <laughs> it's like, like it's we like we live in late capitalism, so you have to have a business. You have to be able to put on a business head at times about certain things. But like, if you if you're thinking of everything as a business from the get go, I think that's a problem. And uh, but anyway, so I was just lucky that I was able to like kind of come home, and that you know I've been able to keep making music with people that I love and that I have. Um, have had the support of Discord Records, which, I mean, for me, there's no other label that I would want to be on, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's that's the lesson that I sort of learned from the, from the Atlantic thing, is that I was initially right to not want to get um, involved in this sort of, you know, uh, skyscraper-dwelling, cigar-chomping side of the music industry you know <laughs> yeah. so uh so that's that's i mean i don't know if that answers your question or not no uh, yeah it, it does it's kind of interesting though because you talked to use the word groundswell especially about stuff 30 years ago and there there was especially in the 90s you had you had grunge you had that movement you had even there was a brief moment for ska music and and all of that and labels kind of gobbled up, major labels gobbled up a lot of those bands for a cup of coffee, and then that was it. And I kind of wonder these days if the, if the equivalent of that in a very sort of watered-down way is like major labels are drawn to viral videos now. They're, they're drawn to sort of these, the, the, the song, the hook, the 30 seconds, the 45-second thing. Um, does that, you know, is that worrisome? to you in terms of, and I hate to be too precious about music and real music and all that stuff, but really though, it does that kind of push out the ability for, for genres like, you know, the DIY scene or, or the grunge scene or the ska scene, even swing, like <laughs> whichever you want to take, like the real music, is that even possible to have happen anymore because the focus is on what sells so quick? Well, 
but I think, but uh, yes, I think it's possible. But I think that it's like the difference is that, um, it. I think, I think that, I think that we do better the less we think about economies of scale. You know, mm -hmm. like. Yeah. Like, it's sort of like when you're, I mean, I remember I used to make fun of this all the time and I have loads of friends who completely get this too. And, you know, like, it's, it's like a, it's when, you know, like when I was in my teens and twenties and I started going on tour with bands, you know, there's always certain relatives that you have who have and for some people it's your whole family right and like yeah. for, my, for me it's my whole family like your, your family has no concept of what this underground scene is about you know what it is that's energizing you so they just go oh that's nice when are you going to be on TV when are you are you famous yet are you a rock star yet you know what I mean yeah and, and so it just is like that's not a useful it's it's not you know, it's a, it's a useful metric for Lady Gaga, right, mm -hmm. or somebody, or like it's a useful metric for Billie Eilish or whomever. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's not a useful metric for music writ large, right? Mm -hmm. Because of course, if you look at it and that, if you look at it from that perspective, you know, I mean, I think you for sure, right? You could make a valid. Um, I mean, it's a valid concern, like the, the atomizing of people's attention, you know, um, the, the like sort of whittling away into tinier and tinier fragments, you know, that like, like it's sort of such a sound by culture now, you know, and it just seems to be getting more and more that way. Yeah. So you could, you could say it, you know, as you could talk about that as a thing to worry about as far as like, where is human development going you know what are we doing to ourselves by by slicing you know slicing our attention into these ever finer tinier skinnier bits you know mm -hmm. but but i mean if you're talking about making music i mean i think i think music and creativity are pretty resilient and i think like you know it's like the difference between maybe this makes sense this makes sense in my mind right like i will say that some of my favorite shows that i've seen my favorite concerts that i've seen in the last five years have happened in people's living rooms mm. you know mm -hmm. there's a place in baltimore um my pr our friend scott uh has been hosting shows in his house for a long time now but you know i've seen john vanderslice and mark eitzel you know, and, and I've played in his living room and um, Quattrocento, a Baltimore band that I really love. And um, so Jason Narduzzi, songwriter, you know, song, singer-songwriters, bands, mm -hmm. all sorts. And, you know, 40 people come to this show and it's it's his living room is packed out, right? Yeah. And and so by some measure, like if you go by, to your, by, by a 1990s measure, of success, quote unquote, material success of like selling out a show, you know, okay, in the 1990s, Jawbox at our height, we could headline and sell out a 2,500, 3,000 seat venue, right? Mm -hmm. So, and so now, you know, I, but to me, I would argue that those 40 people in that living room um, are deeply enough invested in whatever is being created, that they're not, their attention and their investment is not based on the model of TikTok and having like a, you know, mm -hmm. super quick soundbite chorus and then it's over or whatever, yeah. you know, or having a funny, funny video or whatever. Like they're there to listen and be absorbed and be in, involved in a, in a moment that is happening between people. So, I have to look at that as like that gives me a lot of hope. I'm like those, so I just feel like I feel like like it's you know, or like like you could talk about AI, right? That like like for the vast majority of people, AI is certainly capable of generating music that 
you know, you can use to wallpaper your life while you're not really paying attention, right? Mm -hmm. If you're just like on your way to Walmart and you're, you know, in your truck and you're driving and you just feel like hearing something, well, AI can churn some shit out that you can... <laughs> you know that just can be your background to your life and no no one the vast majority of people will not really know the difference you know yeah but but there are always going to be there's always going to be someone who knows the difference and someone who actually cares about like an actual person trying to make a connection through music which is such a like you know i mean music is a language right it's not a product it's a language so yeah. And it's a language for saying things that are that can't be that, that, that can't be expressed as clearly in you know just by saying it or by writing it out. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's a, it's a it's a language for the ineffable. So people, I think people are always going to need it, and you're always going to need someone is always going to need a more a, a richer form mm -hmm. in order to say the things that are more rich. You know. So, but I just think, you know, for better or worse, unfortunately, because of the massive cultural forces that we're subjected to all day long, every day, it's, 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 that is that, that kind of attention and that kind of like emotional investment is, it is squeezed to the margins, but I know as a fan of underground music since the eighties, it's, it's always been in the margins, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So it's just that maybe the margins are getting smaller or feeling more separated because, uh, you know, just the way the world is now or whatever. But I, I, I just think, you know, like it, it, it's always been there. There's never not going to be weirdos. <laughs> you know? so, um, which is a thought that I take a lot of comfort from. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, Real quick, I wanted to, to switch over. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I feel like I've already <laughs> done that. But, no, sorry, but, I'm sorry. I can really talk. I know. I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. No, so I apologize. It's, it's all good. But one, one thing I wanted to, to talk about was, of course, and you referenced it before, was, was Unbecoming, uh, which was your first full length that came out uh, only a handful of years ago. And my only question about it was, why did it take you so long to release a full length? Because it's just like a mental, like an like an attitude change. Well, no, there's a lot of reasons actually. There are, there are really too many reasons to name. <laughs> I mean, no, well, just because. I mean, part of it is like an internal thing. Like, like, um, it's taken me. It took me a very very long time to kind of be ready to assume responsibility for the material that I was making. Mm -hmm. You know, like I tend, I've tended in the past always to want to uh, hide behind the identity of a band. But like, I mean, I feel, I mean, collaboration is really important, but, um, oh wow, there's a deer in my front yard. Cool. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, collaboration is really important, but also like, you know, I just... I don't know if it's shyness or, you know, it's whatever kind of reticence it is. Um, it, it, it's always been about having a band, putting a band together and, and, um, for the creating an entity that, that is the band. But at a certain point, um, you know, as I was getting, started getting a little bit older and everybody that I was collaborating with, you know, had many, commitments in their adult lives and you know me included but I was just thinking like it becomes harder and harder you know to sort of reconcile everyone's priorities and you know if if it just there's a whole bunch of reasons you know <laughs> I basically I mean the number one one big reason I have to say um is that um uh which I don't know if I, it's up to your discretion whether you want to put this in the article, but like my, uh, my son, Callum, uh, who was born in 2006, um, he had a very severe, very, very severe physical disability. And so literally like 
just life made it necessary to kind of ration my music Mm. uh, time, you know, Mm -hmm. so that because that was, you know, like um, running the studio, working on projects, making, you know, being a, a good parent, being a good caregiver, all those things, you know, had to take precedence mm-hmm. and so you know I wasn't able to just throw myself into music into my own music all the time I had to do it in bits and pieces mm-hmm. um, so that's um, um, that is probably a big reason but the other the other reason just creatively is that uh, I had a band Sorry, I mean, this is just so long-winded. I really apologize. No, it's okay. <laughs> the, the last sort of band band that I did started as a solo project, and when I got together with the people that uh, that I was playing with, it I felt I was so nervous about the idea that I was I was concocting a solo project. It was the first thing that I was doing when I started achieving some equilibrium. Um, once uh, my wife and I sort of got the hang of caring for our son Mm -hmm. and we we sort of felt like now we have a balance and we sort of understand how how to manage this much more complicated life then I was able to start fitting in like oh I can stay up late tonight and work on a song or whatever so I was demoing songs and I thought maybe it's time to make a solo record and then um, I started being able to play with the other people in the band and uh, and I was like oh this feels like a band that's much more comfortable I I don't want to go out on a limb and say it's a Jay Robbins solo record mm-hmm. look at these awesome people that are playing with me this is a band now it's Office of Future Plans so we made an album of songs that were largely built on demos that I had made mm-hmm. and then we were not able to write collaboratively after that because of time constraints, because of people's temperaments. But I kept on writing and the material that I wrote was trying to be much more, I've I've had this project of just trying over the years to be more and more direct and more, you know, not hide behind such complicated language and not try to you know uh, just I'm just like it was like a reckoning right of saying like what am I trying to do with this well I'm trying to communicate with people I'm trying to find I've been all this whole time I've been trying to find out what is my voice and what do I want to share with people and not be uh, um, and not be shy about it and so I was writing these, these songs that in my mind were simpler and simpler but also I was I hear the whole thing in my head mostly when I come up with something so so I just thought this is getting too complicated mentally emotionally for me to bring these songs to my band when I feel like like all of us together could create something any one person in this band could generate an amazing some amazing material and we could take off from that point but we're not able to because no one has the time to do it so I just need to stop this band and just sort of circle my wagons and just write material as if I'm the only person who's going to play it and try and strip things down so that I can play it acoustically too that's the other thing because I a lot of my writing in the past I would write for you know like a lot of Jawbox songs are almost like um Every, they're all interlocking parts and if you take any one person's part and hear it on its own it just sounds like nonsense mm-hmm. it only works as a totality mm-hmm. of all the you know so there are songs that are impossible to play live that you would never dream of playing acoustically like one person because it would just sound like bashing and shouting you know mm-hmm. yeah. so so but I, I was like I'm gonna grow old doing this this is with me for the rest of my life and I'm gonna write songs that if I'm just on a park bench with a ukulele, I can sing it and you know it's that song. And that's the kind of songs that I wanted to write. So I just thought it's better. I don't know what it's, I don't know how this is going to be, but it, I shouldn't, it can't be that band. It can't be Office of Future Plans anymore. Mm-hmm. It has to just be whatever it's going to be and I'll do it over here on my own terms so I'm not wasting anyone else's time, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so that's part of why it took, it's, it's, it's taking me almost as long to answer this question as it did to make the damn record. But that's, so, but that's a, you know, so, but it's, but it's complicated. But basically that's, that's sort of what it was. It's kind of like thinking to myself, it's better if I sort of start from scratch and could just, you know, see where that takes me. And then the actual process just took a long time because once again, you know, real life. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I thought the new one was going to take, I, I was I was determined after that took like, that was, Unbecoming was like four years of sporadic effort. And I was like, all right, if I do another one of these, I'm going to do it fast. It's not going to be another four years. Well, guess what? It was another four years. <laughs> <laughs> so just ended up that way. Um, you have, and now this is, I kind of wanted to wind up with this, but you you have had a lot of success as a producer. Um, and you've worked with a lot of uh, really, you know, really cool names and a lot of really cool bands. But this, instead of the bands that, that a lot of people might know you for working with, like you had mentioned, uh, Clutch, and, and there are there's a, a list of a ton of great bands, like the Dismemberment Plan, it goes on and on. But are there bands that you've worked with, or maybe even bands currently, that, that you think are not getting a lot of attention that you would like to kind of lift up and say, hey, everybody... I've I've worked with these guys. This is a great band. I don't know why they're not getting as much love as they're getting, but everybody go check them out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I mean, you know, if I think about it that way, it's like every band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have to say it, you know, like almost. But um But yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know that I'd want to, you know, I don't know that I'm in a great position to single anybody out, you know. Okay. Um, that's fair. Yeah. That that's fair. Yeah. I, I mean, there's there have been uh, just like looking at the list of 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 all the people you've worked with through the years, there has to be some some stories that really stick out with you in the studio, and I I'm kind of curious too as to how you. How did the transition go, if there was even a transition, between being an artist and a producer? Did that just fit naturally for you? Uh, I think it just... I think it's it's one of a number of things that just happened, in a way. I mean, I can't say it just happened, because I did... I did pursue the opportunity... Like, I was just was always crazy about the studio ever... in every band I've ever been in, like... The, the you know I, I mean I remember the first time I went in the studio with Government Issue and I was just like you know that the translating this thing that we were doing in a practice space and hearing it come back from the speakers you know sounding like a record and and then you know looking at how it was captured you know oh why why is this microphone here why is this you know why do we record the drums in the biggest room, you know, or whatever it might be, just all those things, you know, like from the get-go, it was fascinating to me. So I just would take every opportunity to like, to be in the studio and, and, you know, it's like you, it's like, it's like you have an idea in your head, you hear something in your head and then you make it manifest. It's like, no way. It's incredible. It always feels like magic. So, Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I just, you know, sort of kept, kept at it and kept trying to think creatively in the studio. And then I just had a couple of opportunities to go, um, essentially be like, you know, chaperone, coach, spotter, like whatever you want to call it. Like not, not an engineer, but, but a producer in the sense of someone whose ear the band trusts and, and, you know, a, a someone who's not in the thick of it so you know they can you can say even something as quotidian as like hey you know i think you're i think you need to tune your guitar or you guys were speeding up in that take or you know what if you like i think i've heard you play that better i've heard you sing that with more energy or you know what if there was a harmony here all the, all that's all that kind of like musical kind of coaching stuff I had a couple chances to do that and and then I was just very very fortunate that it was a case of you know one band telling another band you know sort of word of mouth like I worked with Kerosene 454 and then 
Texas is the reason guys heard that I had and they were big Jawbox fans so they asked me to produce their record and they were friends with Promise Ring and mm -hmm. the Texas record turned out good so then Promise Ring asked you know asked me along and 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 that's just how it happens sort of from one thing to the next and and I just kind of threw myself at it because you know it's different it's not it's nothing like writing your own song but it is just that that kind of being around that kind of energy the energy of people really dedicating themselves to their creativity mm -hmm. you know that's that's um that's you know that's just about the apex for me i can't think of anything much better than that in the world so yeah um so i just try to keep throwing myself at it uh Real quick, because I, I do want to make sure that we get uh, something about the, the new record in, I, and this is just sort of a basic question, but I am curious about it, because I, I did give it a listen, and I, I like it a lot. It's a really, really good record. Um, Thank you. Do you have a favorite song on it, and why would it be your favorite song? Um, That's a tough question, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> you love so them all very, equally. Uh, that's not very helpful, but it's you know. I mean, I I don't I don't think I do have a favorite song. Okay, that's yeah. that that no, that's fair. That's fair. Um, yeah, that that's all I got. I'm I'm really uh, sorry for taking so much of your time. I feel bad, man. <laughs> no, I'm the one who can't. I'm the one who can't shut up. So thank you for your patience. Yeah, good good luck with the new record and um and we look forward to you coming to Frederick. It, it should be a fun night. Yeah, I'm really I'm really excited. I'm excited to see Gaspers because I've only um, I recorded their record but I've never seen them play, so that'll be fun. Yeah, they're they're really really good. It should be should be a pretty great night all around. So, thank you so so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And again, good luck with everything. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Have Take a good it easy. You too. The Could Be Better podcast is recorded somewhere with suspect Wi-Fi in the United States of America. We've been without a studio for several decades, but have finally, finally moved to the real estate where the talks tick and the West's yay. What? Actually, we're, we're live now, now, but you're listening later. So please follow us on Instagram, Facebook threads and blue sky and don't forget to check out our website for literally everything else at www.couldbebettermeh.com also pretty 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 please leave us a review on apple podcasts overcast spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts or don't and then let us continue believing what we're doing has purpose and meaning and you like us and plus don't forget to check out all of our other podcasts exclusively within the could be better podcast network which includes just us for right now as the other pods be sleeping hey shout to kiki shout to stitch shout to my magnum opus ish and hell if all else fails Check out Smartless because we were friends with Jason, Will, and Sean. Wait, we know those guys? Of course. <laughs> we welcome to Arrested Development. I'm Colin McGuire. And I'm Chris Perry. Thanks for listening. And don't forget, this always could be better. <laughs>